rising up over the distant hills all too soon will make its impact on the rivers of the plain. The rains which nourish life can also deal destruction and death. The fact is not easily forgotten by the farmers who've lived their lives in New Zealand's South Wairarapa district. To such men and their families, the rains with their aftermath of flood-borne devastation have been not just an occasional accident, but a regular yearly menace, curbing their efforts to produce more, eroding the hard-won gains of past years, threatening even to sweep away their livelihood. Flooding in the region has been recorded almost from the first day of settlement in the 1840s. 1880 was a bad year. So was 1947, when these scenes were photographed. But though some years were worse than others, scarcely a single winter has gone by without some flooding. Stock losses, damage to pastures and fencing, to roads and buildings, and the farmers' homes has amounted to countless thousands of dollars. The relative suddenness of floods has caught men and machines unawares in the very midst of flood protection work. Since 1945, the Wairarapa Catchment Board has been responsible for soil conservation, river control and protection against flooding. The new board quickly instituted a comprehensive scheme for recording rainfall and river levels at key points in the catchment. By the early 1950s, it was able to provide a reliable early warning system. Radio supplied the link between automatic recorders strategically located in the catchment and the board's offices in Masterton, enabling catchment board staff to monitor the river systems by remote control as frequently as prevailing weather conditions dictated. The data received made it possible to chart a potential flood in advance of its arrival. Information could then be passed to certain nominated farmers in the danger area, who in turn undertook to pass it on to their neighbours. Being a jump ahead of the oncoming waters, the Lower Valley farmers have had many an occasion to be thankful for the early warning system. Most farms in the district have at least some higher ground to which stock could be moved for safety. As well, catchment board staff over the years were able to build increasing reliability into the system. Rob Donald's farm is one of several reaching to the shores of Lake Wairarapa. Advance warning of flood conditions gave to these farmers, as to others throughout the lower valley, greater confidence to stock and graze their low-lying land, gaining substantial benefit from flood-prone but otherwise valuable acres. But flood warnings are at best a defensive measure. What was needed was control. Yet the problem was massive. The Wairarapa region forms part of the southern tip of New Zealand's North Island. The main Wairarapa Valley is bounded on both sides by steep hills. To the west, the Tararua and Rimataka Ranges. To the east, the Harangi and Mangaraki Ranges. This broad central valley, stretching all the way to Palliser Bay, is a rich alluvial plain extending over an area of 110 square miles. The major portion of this fertile plain lies in the lower valley, and over much of its area is very few feet above sea level. Wairarapa enjoys a generally temperate climate. Rainfall averages 40 inches, with a minimum in the Martinborough area of 29 inches. At the other extreme, the high western ranges have experienced up to 200 inches. It's in these ranges that the Ruhr Mahanga River rises. This river was the core of the entire flood problem. Descending rapidly from its source in the tussock high above the bush line, the river soon reaches the wide, flat Wairarapa Valley. Crossing the plain, it becomes a playground.
More significantly, the Ruamahanga is the main drainage channel for the valley. 90 miles of twisting, turning river serving a catchment area of 1,334 square miles. Because of the low lie of so much of the lower valley, heavy rains could rapidly create river overflows of near disaster proportions. Two further factors contributed to the flood risk. The Ruamahanga River flowed into and out of Lake Wairarapa, which in effect acted as an inefficient reservoir. From there, it emptied into the shallow Lake Onoki. This lake is separated from the sea only by a sandbar, through which a channel must remain open. The same adverse weather conditions which bring widespread heavy rain to Wairarapa also aid the sea to close the lake outlet. In earlier days, teams of horses labored to reopen the channel. Much greater horsepower now eases and speeds the task. Storms still make it necessary to call in the bulldozers several times each year. This is one aspect of the problem that may never be overcome. Nevertheless, the major cause of flooding was the river itself, the Ruamahana. In the past, it had regularly overflowed its banks within hours after heavy rains, inundating as much as 40,000 acres of land. Over the years, various schemes had been considered but put aside. Then, in the early 1960s, the Wairarapa Catchment Board put forward a bold plan incorporating the best of previous schemes. A plan to contain most potential floods in the river channel and provide controlled overflow and storage during occasional very heavy precipitations. Phase one included widening and clearing the lower reaches. A three mile diversion channel bypassing Lake Wairarapa. Further channel improvement up to the 10 mile mark and an upland cutoff, diverting a number of minor tributaries. Phase two, floodgates across the outlet from Lake Wairarapa, preventing backflow. And an overland floodway to take excess water in times of major flood direct to the lake for storage. Phase three, Reclamation of parts of the lake bed as shown and also adjacent swampland to provide 13,000 acres of new farmland and essential works in the tributary rivers and hill catchments. Work on the scheme began in 1964, but before the first machine could be started, considerable paperwork was necessary. Construction plans were prepared by the catchment board staff. The importance of careful planning was underlined by the scheme's estimated cost, $5 million, subsidized by the Soil Conservation and Rivers Control Council. This was New Zealand's biggest flood control project, not to be completed until 10 years after survey parties had put the first pegs in place. Nevertheless, estimates had also shown that the cost would be fully covered in five to six years after completion by the increased agricultural production it would allow. In mid-September 1964, this giant rapier W90 dragline began work in earnest. The W90's job, together with several smaller draglines, was to build, by 1968, nearly 20 miles of stop banks, flanking the 10-mile stretch of the Ruamahanga River from Tuitarata to the sea. Three months later, workers had begun assembling dredge pontoons. And in January 1965, the dredge itself arrived from overseas. It made its first cut on February the 12th, deepening a channel into Lake Onoki before it too tackled the river. The proposed new width of the river required the dredge to make three parallel cuts, advancing upstream first in one cut for several chains, then retiring to take a bite into the second or third cut. The aim was a clear channel, complete with stop banks, capable of carrying a peak flow of 45,000 cusacks, a two-fold increase over existing channel capacity. Meanwhile, 
the dredged material was utilized to build up low-lying and swampy land in adjacent disposal areas, later to be developed by the Lands and Survey Department for farming. The raw earth stock banks, most of which were built by the W90, were brought to their final design shape first by smaller drag lines and later by crawler tractors equipped with dozer blades. Chain harrows were subsequently used to prepare the soil for sowing down. As the major works progressed, it was necessary to deal with the tributary rivers, like the Tawanui. The Tawanui, Tuanganui and other catchments were prone to massive slips which supplied unwelcome shingle to the main river system. Most of this country has now been retired from grazing and systematically planted out with pines or treated with other conservation measures. Further attention was required downstream where the riverbeds leveled out. Shingle from the slipping hillsides was being deposited over large areas of comparatively flat farmland. Frequent changes of course made the situation worse. To combat this, groins were constructed using trimmed willow. Partially buried in shingle banks, these would help provide a permanent, stable course for the river. Despite the seeming barrenness of its environment, the willow would soon form roots and develop new growth. The stream training was supplemented by extensive tree plantings alongside. Adjoining the previous winter's plantings, willows were again used because of their known ability to establish themselves in the shingle. However, in the winter of 1967, poplar stakes were introduced as well. In contrast to the willows, these could be expected to have an economic value at maturity. The success of the plantings was confirmed the following spring. Nearby, the previous year's plantings too responded to the new season. Unstable headwaters in the western catchment requiring attention presented a difficult access problem. Planting here was literally dependent on air transport. Meanwhile, the major works were making good progress. Improvement was clearly evident in the lower Ruamahanga, where it enters Lake Onoki. In the distance, the new diversion can be seen taking shape. In January 1967, a little over two years after starting, the big W90 dragline was past the six mile mark, one mile into the diversion, working on the formation of the left stop bank. One of the biggest draglines ever seen in New Zealand, capable of moving three cubic yards at a time, it was in operation for 10 or 12 hours a day. And by the end of phase one of the scheme was to move about one million cubic yards of material. Maintenance called for a man with a good head for heights. Three months behind the W90, by April 1967, the dredge too had reached the six mile mark. Despite several minor floods and some closures of the Lake Onoki outlet to the sea, no serious setbacks had been met. The contractors and the engineers of the Wairarapa Catchment Board could look back on over two years of steady progress. The dredge was working particularly well. Varying percentages of silt, clay and gravel were being encountered at different chainages. But as preliminary tests had indicated, the bulk of the spoil required very little treatment to make it suitable for the establishment of pasture. To get the spoil to each disposal area, 12 feet long sections of 18 inch diameter steel pipe were laid across country from temporary shore stations. More pipeline carried on pontoons connected the dredge to the shore. At times the material was being pumped by the dredge as far as half a mile from the shore connection. The path of the new diversion lay through the Puafa Flats, 
low-lying land with numerous lagoons, into which several minor rivers discharged. Rising in the eastern ranges, the Harangis and the Mangarakis, these rivers have quite high flood flows and frequently inundated the Puafa Flats. To give relief to the area, the scheme provided for a water cutoff. Slicing across country, upland of the lagoon region, the cutoff channel would effectively gather in a sizable portion of runoff from the eastern catchments. The design allowed for carrying even maximum foreseeable peak flows from the rivers concerned. The outfall of this upland water cutoff was direct into the main diversion. The triangle of land between the cutoff and the diversion, including the Poafa and Rangatea lagoons, was thus free of flood risk from the hill catchments. This pump station, linked to a network of new drains, was to be a key factor in lowering the water table throughout the Poafa Flats area. The pump unit, installed in December 1967, was the biggest of several placed at strategic points in the lower valley. This unit would lift drainage water into the cutoff adjacent. In this way, production capacity could be substantially increased on several hundred acres of previously marginal or outright swampland. The lagoons themselves had by now been filled with spoil from the dredging operations. Notice the raw looking areas to the left. This is the upstream end of the diversion just after completion. At this stage, October 1967, the main river flow still followed its old course into Lake Wairarapa. Upstream of the diversion, preparations were in hand for another disposal area, this time in the Tehopai district. Removal of water pumped with the spoil created recurrent difficulties because of the low lie of the terrain. Here, a temporary drain would link up with the existing channels, draining Tehopai Lagoon. The swampy nature of this type of country often prevents access by heavy machinery. In this case, there was only one practical alternative. The banking which marked the perimeters of the disposal areas gave control over the spreading of the spoil delivered by the dredge. The depth of fill varied from a few inches to several feet, depending on the size of the particular disposal area and the quantity of material available to it. Surplus water was channeled back into the river, or as here at Tehopai, into Lake Wairarapa. Through the Tehopai area too, a new road was under construction. Sited adjacent to the right bank of the river, it would serve a number of farms on the Kumenga Peninsula, the area between the diversion and the lake. Access to these farms up to this time had been via Kumenga Road, which intersected with the diversion. Early in February 1968, the dredge, having almost completed its work, returned to Kumenga Road to sever it. Because this was in the nature of a local historic event, Catchment board members and nearby farmers took the opportunity to observe the operation. The board's chief engineer, Mr. Peter Marnie, was on hand, together with Mr. Hans van der Wall, project manager for the contractors, and Mr. Harold Parsons for the subcontractors. Although supervised locally by the Wairarapa Catchment Board, the scheme's progress was a source of satisfaction too to the Soil Conservation and Rivers Control Council, the national agency through which the government subsidy was being channeled. In the morning of Friday the 16th of February, work began on the channel block which would close off the Rua Mahanga from its old course into Lake Wairarapa and with the help of the dredge, direct it instead into the new diversion. The catchment board's chief engineer and his staff were again at the site to keep an eye on progress. The ever-present W90 was among the machines engaged in building the block, using some 30,000 cubic yards of fill, previously stockpiled. 
men and machines would work through the night and through the following day and night before the old Ruhr Mahanga channel was finally sealed off. For the engineers and contractors, this was the climax of a difficult operation. With the channel block in place, the lower reaches of the river were now under better control than ever before. Two weeks later, on the 6th of March 1968, the completion of phase one was marked officially. Chairman of the Wairarapa Catchment Board, Mr. G.H. Blundell, welcomed the official party and the many residents of the district who attended. Co-chairman of the ceremony was Mr. Peter Costain, representing the principal contractors, Costain Blancfort UK Dredging Company. The Honourable P.B. Allen, MP, Minister of Works in the ruling national government, spoke of the scheme's contribution to the country's development and unveiled a commemorative plaque. At times, the world must have seemed upside down for those in the path of progress. But the Lower Wairarapa Valley Development Scheme was proving itself already, and still greater protection would be afforded as it advanced through Phase 2.